our keynote speaker this evening. It's Bob Donegan, and I'm really honored to have him. He came all the way over from Richmond, Washington to be here this evening. Bob is the president of Ivers Restaurants, now in its 85th year. The company operates more than 60 locations throughout Puget Sound and employs about 1,000 people. Bob joined Ivers in 1997 as the chief financial officer and became president in 2001. In addition to his day job, Bob spends a lot of time working with and volunteering with many, many wonderful um, associations and organizations. Please give a warm welcome as Bob Donican joins us on stage. Well, we are delighted to be here tonight. <clears throat> Lisa and I come over to the county frequently. Our older daughter was married at Lake Crescent. Um, on uh, April 17th, we will be on one of your hidden beaches for Oyster Easter. We bring the family over, harvest oysters and clams, and cook them on the beach. Uh, one of our favorite hikes is Mount Townsend at the north end of the Olympics. So it's a treat to meet so many people who are providing the jobs for people who work here. So what we have here is a quick history of Ivers and the big question, how did we survive Corona? So we'll start with Ivers' birth. He was born in West Seattle in 1905, a single child of single children, a Norwegian mother and a Swedish father. Um, in 1928, he graduated from the University of Washington with a well-timed degree as a stockbroker. <laughs> and when the families in West Seattle and the businesses in West Seattle stopped paying rent, he had to get a job. Friends of his in Seaside, Oregon, were dipping marine life out of the bay, putting it in glass tanks and charging people a nickel to see it. So in 1938, on the central waterfront on Pier 3, he opened his first aquarium. And you can see it in the northeast corner here of Pier 3, where the octopus is painted on the outside. Here he is off to Amish Head in West Seattle, harvesting fish for the aquarium. Of course, um, this is what it looked like inside, pretty rudimentary. He was a marketing wizard. Every early December, he would load Patsy the seal into a stroller and take her up to Frederick and Nelson to get a picture with Santa. Guess what newspaper published this on the front of the paper, the Seattle Times and the PI, free advertising for his aquarium. But he was making, he was getting more visits to his fish bar, which was next door to the aquarium, than to the aquarium. So if you look here in the foreground, you can see the fish bar that he opened. And if you look way in the background on the right, you can see the sign for the aquarium. He closed the aquarium and donated the marine life to the Stanley Park Aquarium in, up on Vancouver Island. And if it was still open, it's in recess right now, and you visited, those are the descendants of Ivers' original marine life. <clears throat> and where the aquarium was, he opened Ivers' Acres of Clams. Here's a picture of the restaurant. <clears throat> you can tell without even looking at it that it was a seafood restaurant in the 40s and the 50s from the Japanese floats hanging from the ceiling and the nets. If you look along the uh, wall next to the roof, there is Ivor's grandmother's china collection. And when we remodeled the restaurant in 2015, we took those down, and I had hoped to put them back in the new restaurant, but unfortunately they had drilled through the plates and those hand-painted chinas all broke, so they didn't make it. Um, <clears throat> remember we talked about him being a marketing wizard? Most of the offices in downtown Seattle looked onto the top of Pier 3 to advertise his restaurant when he put heating, ventilating, and air conditioning in. Instead of using the typical distribution network, he distributed it with an octopus. This is a famous picture. Does anybody recognize the mistake in the picture? How is the bus powered? It's a trolley bus. The trolley line in Seattle was on First Avenue. It's not on Alaskan Way. When Ivor had the bus painted, he wanted to have a picture taken with it. So without telling the city, he hired a tow truck, 
went up to First Avenue, unhooked the trolley. You can see all the people who were on the bus standing there. Sidon Quest, the chef with his white toque on and Ivor next to him, took this picture. He handed everybody a certificate for disturbing their commute, put it back on the tow truck, took it back up to First Avenue. And when this picture started to appear in the newspapers, when the city found out what had happened. <laughs> um, he, of course, was one of the founding members of the Century 21 Exposition in 1962 at the Seattle Center. He had a booth there. Here's the full page advertisement that he ran. Notice it's in color in the 60s when there wasn't a lot of color in the newspaper. He also put on the fireworks for 44 years until we ended it during the recession in 2008. This is the poster that the hit fireworks company used to advertise its fireworks program. The hits fireworks company was on Rainier Avenue South in the middle of downtown Seattle. They were making fireworks downtown. <laughs> Interestingly, Ivor also discovered that he was making many, many orders of clams. And in Port Townsend, in 1983, he opened Ivor's clam farm. It ties back to the fireworks in that Ivor being a quirky guy, not only did he commission a clam dredge be built, but it also had to be the base from which he could set fireworks off. Of course, operating a clam farm is different from operating restaurants, so after two years he shut it down, but he kept the name of the clam dredge, and the name of the clam dredge was the Keep Clam, and that, of course, is our slogan. In the 60s and the 70s, Ivor tra Iver traveled frequently to Asia, and when he came back in 1966 from a trip, he went to his real estate broker, Nick Nickerson, with the hat on here, said, Nick, I want to open Ivor's Roman Baths on a barge in Ballard. And Nick said to him, Ivor, you're crazy. You don't know anything about baths and barges. And Nick brought him this site. Anybody recognize it? Well, this is what it looks like today. There's the I-5 bridge, and below it is the Salmon House. Now, the next time you go to the Salmon House, you might see something that you've never seen before. And that is, in the center part of the restaurant, there's an elevated area. And that's where the original fire pit, like a native longhouse, would have been. And in 1969, when he opened the restaurant, he had invited the Chamber of Commerce. It's a group like this. The Chamber of Commerce, all the electeds, all the media. Everything in the restaurant was cooked over alder the way the local natives would have done it. When you open a restaurant that's fueled with alder in the middle of winter, what happens when you light that alder up? A native longhouse would not have had exhaust fans in it. It had two little smoke holes up in the roof. The restaurant filled with smoke. The fire department had to came and come and break out the building to get people out. And the next time you go to the salmon house, there are two big 16-inch cedar beams, and if you look up, you can see the char marks that are still there. Ivor died in 1985. He had two wives, not at the same time, <laughs> no children. So half of his estate was given to the University of Washington, what's now the Foster School, from which he had graduated, and the other half went to the School of Hospitality over in the business school at Washington State. All the benefits went there. <clears throat> The value of the estate in May 1985, when it was probated, was about $11.5 million. And if you visit either of those campuses, you will not find a building name for Ivor, nor an endowed chair, nor a scholarship. He didn't want credit, he just wanted kids to get educated. So, this is what we look like today. After he died, his five senior lieutenants were given the right to buy the company. First thing they did was bought Kid Valley four years later. Kid Valley had four restaurants at the time. Um, and this is what the company looks like today. We have three full service restaurants, Acres of Clams down in the waterfront where Ivor had the fish restaurant with the Japanese floats, the Salmon House on Lake Union and Muckleteo Landing up in Muckleteo, 19 seafood bars, each one's about 2,200 square feet, 35 parking spaces, 
a drive through if we can find it, on the going home side. Um, vis serves about 250,000 customers a year, does about a million and a half dollars worth of sales from Bellingham to Tacoma. Third thing, the five Kid Valley stores. This is the original one in the University District uh, near the University of Washington. Next thing, the Mariners came to us in 1998 and asked us to open in stadiums. We didn't know anything about stadiums. But the little fish bar, 700 square feet in front of Acres of Clams on the waterfront, does about three and a half million dollars in sales. And they said, you'll figure out how to do stadiums. <laughs> so this is our first booth. It's behind first base on the main level. And we had a second booth behind third base on the upper level. There are 102 food booths at then Safeco Field. And in that first year, our booths were number one and number two in volume. So in the second year, they asked us to open Kid Valley. So there's a Kid Valley in the left field corner on the main level, and a Kid Valley behind first base on the upper level. And in the second year, we were one, two, three, and four in volume. So we've become pretty good at operating in stadiums. The next business, our fifth division, is our chowder business. And because we're Ivers, we don't measure things in pounds or gallons the way anybody else would. We instead say if you take every gallon of chowder we produced and poured it in a six ounce cup, like the one on your coffee cup on your plate, and stack them one atop the other, it would be 4,636 space needles tall. Or if you're a Mount Rainier person, it'd be the equivalent of 195 Mount Rainiers. Or if you're a Boeing engineer, because our secret chowder plant is across the street from Boeing's wide body assembly factory, instead of filling a refueling tanker with fuel, you filled them with chowder, it would fill 11 tankers full of chowder. That's just last year's production. So how did we get through corona? This is what the company looked like in 2020 before corona hit. You can see the five divisions in the office. We had about 1,000 employees, 850 in the winter, 1,100 in the summer. This is what it looked like at the worst of corona. You can see the drop in the number of units from 65 to 22 and the number of employees from 974 to a few over 300. If you instead don't like to look at numbers but like to look at graphs, this is what it looks like graphically. You can see what a normal year is like. You can see what Corona did. And you can see where we are with the little one over on the left side. We're approaching the same numbers we were at. So the question is, how did we get there? So here are the dozen rules that Ivor taught us and that we've evolved. Number one, good customer service starts with happy employees. So when Ivor opened the Salmon House, after he rebuilt it, after the fire in 1969, in 1970, Sue, Louie, and Donna, way over on the right, were in the crew. And on their 37th anniversary, here's a picture of them holding the picture, and there they are. Their kids and their grandkids work for us. Does anybody remember what happened on December 8th, 2008? The Seahawks were playing the Green Bay Packers at Quest Field, and there was a snowstorm. <clears throat> Sue and Donna live in the International District. Even though they thought the restaurant would be closed, they were afraid their customers would arrive and they wouldn't be there. So these two women, in their 70s, walked 4.2 miles from the International District over Capitol Hill to be in the restaurant because if their employees showed up, they were going to be there. How do you hire people like that? Good customer service starts with happy employees. Second thing, when you find good employees, hire them because they're enthusiastic and train them for the skills they need. So Joe Visentainer, the guy with the cap on here, was brought to us in the 70s by his sisters. He's a Tourette's guy. He swears under his breath. He's got lots of ticks. And he became the patio boy at Acres of Clams and the Fish Bar. He unloaded the trucks. He cleaned the tables. He serviced people. <clears throat> and if you were ever a visitor on the waterfront, taking a picture of your kids taking, feeding french fries to the gulls, Joe would come over and snatch the camera out of your hand 
and he'd say, you're on vacation too, get over there with your family, and nobody was gonna argue with Joe. <laughs> but look at the tenures of the people working at the fish bar, and look at the diversity of the people working at the fish bar on the day that Joe retired. Every quarter, we index every employee we have, and we compare our, <coughs> our employment ba base with the population around our stores because we want our stores to look like the people that we're serving. Every, <coughs> every month I write a letter to the bank, it's not first fed. <laughs> and the best part of the letter I write is I identify the five longest tenure employees. You see Carrie Thompson there? Every fifth anniversary after people get to 25 years, we give them a special gift that their family or the people who work with them tell us they want. Kerry wanted to visit the Philippines where his dad had served in World War II. So here he is over there. Do the math. What happens next month with Kerry? He gets to his 50th anniversary. Kerry's 67 years old. It's the only job he's ever had. And look at everybody else on the list is also well tenured. Next thing, when you find good employees, don't let them leave. You may remember that on October 28, 2003, a big wave hit our restaurant up in Mukilteo. When we reopened that restaurant after rebuilding it in February 2005, this was the crew that was there, 2005. Last year, on the anniversary of our opening, I identified the people who are still in the staff. 2005, 2021, 16 years, look it. Most of the staff is still there in restaurants. Next rule of thumb, when people do a good job, recognize it. So every year we pick a clammy winner. And the clammy is a wrestler's body with his head lopped off and a gold clam put on the top. <laughs> and in 2005, when Todd Lywicki came to the Seahawks, he discovered that the number one complaint was the concession food is lousy, the lines are long, and the prices are too high. And so he came to us and said, I've seen what you're doing at Safeco Field. Would you come help us solve the food at Quest Field? So Joe Visentainer, the little guy here, was the opening manager of the stadium. And we selected Joe as the clammy winner. But Joe hates the spotlight. And we knew that if we told Joe he was going to win the clammy, he'd be angry. So before the NFC Championship game, in 2005, I asked Joe if he would present the clammy to Todd, who brought us into the stadium. And I went to Todd and said, hey, Todd, Joe's going to be the clammy winner. Can you just give it back to him? So Joe presents the clammy to Todd. Todd gives it to Joe. Joe thinks he's misunderstand. He gives it back to Todd. <laughs> Todd says, Joe, look up at the TV broadcast. See, it says Joe Scola, Ivers Clammy Winnie. Joe was so upset, he left the stadium. We didn't see him for two weeks. <laughs> when people do a good job, you recognize them for it. Next rule of thumb, in restaurants, turnover is between 250% and 400% a year. So those 1,000 employees we have, in a, if we were a normal restaurant, we would hire 4,000 people a year to fit them. So we significantly increase the pay for managers we have a benefits program that's as good as any law firm or technology company in town in a restaurant environment. The result is our turnover, you can see the numbers there, in 21, corona year, for management was 36% and among the staff it was 125%. If you take the stadium employees out of there, our turnover would have been about 75%. Next rule of thumb, really know your guests well. So we interview 400 customers in two or three stores every other year. And we've been doing this for 24 years, and we evaluate where we're winning and where we're losing. On this chart, I've identified the typical performance of a national restaurant. And I'll just call your attention to a couple things and compare it to our seafood bars. Number one, if you're a typical visitor to a quick service restaurant, you visit that restaurant once a month or once every six weeks. Our typical customer visits us every 10 days. If you're a typical quick service restaurant customer, you share your dining out occasions among six to eight places. That's 12 to 16% of your share of stomach goes to any one restaurant. Our customers give us half of their dining out occasions. And then go way to the bottom. 
The market research firm that we use has been doing this for 40 years, and Don Morgan tells us that that customer satisfaction score, question is how likely are you to refer this restaurant to your friends? Extremely likely, likely, not likely, absolutely not. We only measure the top. 93% of our customers are in that top box. Those are higher scores than the typical restaurant. So we know our customers pretty well. We focus on fresh, wild, and local stuff. There's no farmed fish on our menu. There's farmed shellfish, but no farmed finfish. And all the fishes that you know, we're using them all the time, including fish from the peninsula. Although we don't use any king or chinook salmon because of their sensitivity with uh, orcas right now. Next thing, customers like to talk to us in different ways. Some people like to write comment cards. So there's written comment cards in every one of our stores. Some people write, like to write emails. Some people like to talk to people on the phone. If you call the office, you don't get voicemail. You get Bonnie or Laurel, and they take track of everything. So we keep track of everything that customers say, and the result is we can be much more responsive to what their concerns are. And what this results in is we can calculate the lifetime value of a customer. So we know that when someone came in yesterday, he or she spent $14.07 on fish and chips and chowder and a drink. And when he or she came in, there were 1.6 people with them. We know they come in every 10 days. We don't know how long they come in, because we've only been doing this research for 25 years, so we've assumed 25 years. And if you multiply and add all that, the lifetime value of a customer is $32,000. So if you screw up, the chowder's too cold, you gave them a two-piece fish and chips instead of a five-piece fish and chips, you're not saying goodbye to $14, you're saying goodbye to $32,000. And the result is that everybody in the company is authorized to do whatever it takes to solve a problem that a customer has. And my favorite story is Dan Saldine, our senior maintenance guy, who's about 5'6 and 250 pounds, was in the sewer at the salmon house cleaning it out in the fall so that the parking lot wouldn't flood during the rain. And as he was there, customers came out from the salmon house complaining about how bad their meal was. Dan said, hey, can you stay here for a minute? He went into the restaurant. He got four gift cards for $125 a piece. He brought it back to the people and said, here's my business card. I work here. Would you come back? and have another experience and tell me about it. How often do you think those people tell that story? He solved their problem. Next rule of thumb, our vendors are our partners. Here's a couple of them. Jose and Joy. Jose runs a sign company. He's done our signs for 40 years. He retired five years ago. He's got one account that he works on now. It's ours because he likes working with us. Joy Okazaki. The petite woman is the woman who managed the $30 million renovation of Pier 54. Delightful people. The center group is the Quipoc Indian tribe up on the Yukon River in Alaska. They were catching chum salmon and throwing them on the bank. They weren't bleeding them. They weren't heading them. They weren't gutting them. They weren't icing them. And the result was their chum salmon were being sold literally for dog food. And we said to them, if you bleed them as soon as you catch them, head them and gut them and put them on ice, we'll pay you a dollar a pound more than you're getting now. And the result is if you go into any of our seafood bars and get the broiled salmon sandwich or broiled salmon Caesar, it's a chum salmon coming from the Quipoc tribe. And then the last group is the, a group of Norwegians from Ballard and native claim settlement people from Bristol Bay that operate uh, the boat, the northern leader, that harvests about 800,000 to a million pounds of cod for us a year. Uh, last thing, we measure things not by the week or the month or the year. We measure things by the decade. This is the central waterfront in Seattle in February 2016 when the seawall was being replaced. During this time when no one could get to the restaurant is when we spent $35 million to renovate that pier knowing that there were four more years of construction, we would not get paid back for that for at least a decade. We invest for the long term. And the last rule of thumb is, you may have seen that Bertha, the tunnel boring machine, got stuck. Remember what she hit? 
supposed to be a pipe. It wasn't a pipe, it was one of Ivor's big clams down there. <laughs> so here's some things that we tried during Corona. If it's in red, it failed. If it's in green, it's something that we had success with. Here's our results during Corona. We were able to keep 25 restaurants open. We served over seven million customers during that time. Only seven employees uh, were confirmed with corona, all exposed outside work. No transfer among employees of corona, no transfer from customers to employees. We kept lots and lots of people. We did lose some key managers, but most of the staff is still there. Uh, and here's a final story. On September 27, 2020, we closed the Salmon House because you couldn't seat people in a full service restaurant over the year by the governor's declaration. We laid off 52 people at the Salmon House and we said to them, if you just making up numbers, we're making $1,000 a week and unemployment's gonna give you $500 a week, we will give you another $250 a week to take you up to 75% of where you were before. And because it's a loan, not income, you don't have to declare it against unemployment benefits. And if you come back to work for us, we'll forgive those loans. On top of that, everybody who went on hibernation, everybody who went on hibernation, we are self-insured, so we continued benefits for them and their spouse and their kids because nobody should have been without benefits during corona. <clears throat> On May 17th, 2021, when we reopened the restaurant, 47 of the 52 people who worked there six months earlier came back to us. So when you treat your employees well, they become very loyal. And I think that's it.